Welcome to Exploring Fredericton Homes. I'm Trevor Thurrett. And I'm Chris Turner. In this episode, we explore the world of buying and selling rental properties. Every unit needs loving care, and that's where a property manager comes in. So for the first part of the episode, we're going to speak with Matt Hunter from Dooryard Property Management. So Matt, how long have you had Dooryard operating? We've had it since uh, July of 2019. And what kind of services do you guys provide? So we manage everything from their advertising to cutting their lawns, to snow removal, to moving tenants in, doing all the proper paperwork for Service New Brunswick, all that sort of good stuff. We can handle everything. We're their eyes and ears here in, here in New Brunswick. What made you decide to get into property management? When I look at the market and I enjoy being a landlord, I just thought there was an opportunity here in central New Brunswick to, you know, for another company to come in and just to see what kind of service we can do. So certainly over the last few years, there's been a lot of regulation changes. What has your experience been like going yes. through the process? Yes, there has been. Uh, the province of New Brunswick brought in a rent cap a couple years ago. Um, it, it's just, you know what, it's just, you got to roll with the punches. Um, whatever the, the rentalsmen in the province of New Brunswick say we're doing, that's, you know, we're up on the laws and we, we implement that for our investors and our clients. So there's been a lot of big increases in the rents locally. What do you attribute that to? New landlords that are purchasing these buildings, some are local, some are from Ontario or wherever outside of the province. Um, they have financing on the properties. They have, you know, so they have already, uh, they have financing, they have loans on the properties and the taxes are higher. Um, I know myself, we have some property and all of them got raised this year. Uh, so that attributes to the rents going up. Um, and it's just, they can't pass on that savings like the old uh, landlords might have been able to. So It seems with the hike in interest rates, that has certainly made quite a difference in the price that owners are paying. Yes. And do you feel that there'll ever be any sort of changes that'll come in where the government will regulate it to make it more cost effective for tenants? Or is this what we say is the new norm. I, 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 I would like to say that there would be something the government could do. I, if, I, if, I, if I think they're gonna do anything, I think they're gonna do it on the tenant side with like a rebate, a renter's rebate, here you go. But I believe it's a new norm as far as taxes. You know, the, we know the price of fuel, the price of anything to get, you know, any work done nowadays is higher than it was. Not only are taxes, but our water bills are higher. You know, it, which is understandable. The price of pipe is higher and the price of labor at the city's higher. So everything has gone up. Taxes, water, uh, you name it. And if you had any advice for somebody who's getting into the property management business. Yes. Would you have any advice for them as an investor? It's still a great place to uh, to to invest your money. You know, so over COVID, there was no I, we didn't miss a we didn't miss a beat. No, we didn't miss any rent checks almost every single one of them paid. So, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's COVID immune, but it's pretty darn close. So yeah. I know that a lot of people feel that having a property manager certainly benefits the owner, but from experience, I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, situations where it also benefits the tenant as well. Yeah, yeah, we're full-time on staff. You know, we have an office a lady on staff. I have a licensed plumber on staff. So if we have some issues that arise during the day, uh, you know, sometimes the landlord can't get there. Sometimes if, if they're working or if they're doing other things, uh, it's just, we can be really responsive to the tenant and we know all the paperwork and all the ins and outs and we can help tenants too. Because sometimes, so in New Brunswick, what you do is we submit our security deposits to service New Brunswick. Well, sometimes that can be, you know, there's some paperwork to that and there can be some disconnect. So we can help po folks with the paperwork. Hey. Here's how you get your deposit back. Make sure you have the tenancy number. Make sure you have the proper address of where you're leaving and moving to. All that sort of good stuff. So we've benefited both in my opinion. Yeah. And would you have any advice for tenants who are looking for an affordable rent in this market? Give the property manager or new landlord as much information as possible. So that way, you know, they, you know, sometimes in this market, there's many applicants. So you want to make it as, uh, you know, as easy and as possible and as attractive to move into that next apartment. So I would say get a good landlord reference, get a good work reference if you're working, and uh, that'll really separate you from some of the other tenants. Do you find that there's a lot of landlords that are taking pets currently? So with us, we make the tenants get uh, tenant insurance. 
So if you have a pet, that would cover some of the, the issues that may arise with a pet. Um, so, but it, I would say with the current landlords that we work with, I would say it's about 50-50. Uh, and you had mentioned tenants insurance. Yes. So what is a tenants insurance? Yeah, so tenants insurance, it basically covers all your contents. So it would cover, like if you have a nice laptop computer, if you had a nice artwork on the wall, or if you had, you know, things you might be working on or, or what have you. So it covers a lot of different things and it's easy to get. If you have car insurance, most likely your uh, insurance provider will also give you tenant insurance. And uh, we actually, we require it on our applications. So Matt, you guys have been expanding. How many people would be on staff with Doyard? Yeah, we currently have five full-time employees, but that doesn't count like our, our sub trades. Uh, we have folks coming in and out, painters, uh, you know, crack fillers, plumbers, uh, electricians come in quite a bit. Uh, yesterday, Chris, we actually, we just hired a licensed plumber, full-time on staff to help with uh, anything that arises plumbing wise. And he does some of our estimating and he'll move into uh, managing like the renovations and all that. The thing I'm really noticing with property management is landlords always need something done. If right. it needs a window or a door or a little bit of flooring or a couple rooms painted when a tenant moves out, we have the, the capacity to handle all that. So Matt, starting the property management company, what are some of the challenges that you've run into over the years? Yeah, some of the challenges have been just, you know, making sure tenants are happy with the property, uh, making sure they're up. So one of our big things is we want to protect the landlord or investor's investments. So we want to make sure they're all up to snuff. Uh, we do uh, bi-monthly inspections and we drop in quite often on the properties just to make sure you know hey you, you purchased a property for X amount of dollars you want to make sure it's in good condition and then the next thing you know hey we're checking up on it we do a little report send it off to the landlord it just gives folks especially if they're not locals uh, a peace of mind that one we're doing something we're on top of it and it's protecting their investment right yeah but that that would be one of the bigger challenges and of course you know it, it, just finding staff and the right people because this job is not for everyone it really is not you almost everyone has to have a thick skin in property management because it's you're dealing with folks that's where they live so it's kind of their castle so if you know if the if the power's out for a little while and they lost some food well they're calling about that we you know try and empathize and, and try and fix the situation as best we can uh, you know, or if, the, if there's a little bit of moisture levels high, well then we drop off to humidifiers. Or we work with landlords and tenants to try and make sure, you know, their stay and their lease with us is as is, is enjoyable as possible. That's our goals is to keep growing. We're having fun, we're enjoying it. And uh, you know, we'd like to grow it some more. We now return to exploring Fredericton Homes. In this part of the show, we're gonna meet a very young landlord. And being a landlord is not even his full-time job. As a matter of fact, this full-time student doesn't even have a full-time job. You're in finance. I mean, your finances must have really drawn you towards the idea. You said even from a young age you planned on it? Yeah, exactly. Like, I wasn't planning especially just buying a house, but I was planning on just buying something and just saving as much money as I could until that polymer. And I found my calling when I was in Fredericton and I just saw the opportunities here actually. You're just now going to university. So how old are you, Rock? I, I'm currently, I just turned 19 a few months ago. You're yeah. just only 19 now. And so tell me about that experience. You know, generally we, it's, you know, people who are 30 years old who are trying to find the way to get into that, that yeah. position. So right. tell me about how you did that. How you well, I've always had a little thing for numbers and I'm in business, in university, and I want to major in finance. And since 14, I've just really wor working long hours and saving up my money just because I knew something was coming and I, that buying a house was my calling, I could say. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, five bedrooms and I'm renting all five, including one for myself and my girlfriend. Kind of give me a little bit of, of your background and how you decided that that would be a good way to go. Well, since I just started university last year, honestly, and uh, I just I was renting my room and I had my wall and one aside, and I found if I had the extra money to buy a house and help people out with their first great rental experience, I should I should do that, you know. And I had the money and I was able to start and doing that. Right, you were you've kind of set yourself up 
over your history to be able to buy that house. You, yeah, exactly. You put I, a lot of time and thought into yeah, into yeah. finding a place for yourself. Yeah, because last year I was working two jobs at my own landscaping company and I was working four hours a week at McCain's, which wow. was just more stuff to like have more income to afford to buy my first house. How do you determine who your tenant should be? So it really comes to like just a quiet individual that, you know, enjoy enjoy themselves and are clean and like Mostly students because they're more like uh, studying focus, really. Um, yeah. What have you experienced in terms of having to set leases and rent prices and all that type of stuff? You've you've kind of dialed in who you'd like to have there. Yeah. But tell me about the rest of the experience for yourself and in, in finding out the rest. So finding out the, the rest. Uh, uh, when I got my first roommate, I'll just say like it was not the best experience for myself just because. I was rushing through too much through the process and I wasn't sure what I was looking for at the beginning. Yep. But now I really know and especially if I have really great roommates, I started at one price and I lowered it after a few months just because I want to keep them there for a long time if possible. So you just said that you'll actually lower the rent after a certain amount of time. Can you tell me about that? I really haven't heard of that. Yeah. Well, I'm a particular case, I'll just say it like that, and I live in the house. So I find that it's really great to have the perfect roommates and you don't have to go looking for more afterwards. Because I'll face it, like it's hard to find always good people and going through the process while I'm in school, working and owning the house itself. So if I find I have the greatest person, you know, I want him to stay, geez, I'll lower his rent because I think it's the best thing that will keep them, you know, like won't find anything else elsewhere. So have you had people move out? What, what have you seen in terms of trends and people trying to move in and uh, interest in your place? Uh, interest right now, the biggest one I found is uh, especially people that work in nursing homes. Uh, they have, they're starting to have a little bit big nursing home community in the uh, north side area, which is where my, my house is. And they like to go as closest as the nursing home as possible. So that's where I find the trend. And also students, especially. So students that come from outside, internationals that need a place to lay low. And I have offered a room fully furnished so they don't need to buy a bed, they don't need to buy anything. It's all there, dishes, utensils, everything is there. So tell me about uh, what you see coming up for yourself over the next little bit. Is this something where roommates are leaving every year where they're students or do you have long-term tenants? Well, we have long-term one and we have a few, like honestly, we're gonna have four that's gonna stay for long-term and maybe a fifth one that's gonna stay just like every six months, every year. Because I'm really, like I said, trying to help the people. So if they find that they're moving away or they don't like university, they will move. But besides that, they want to stay there long-term because they find it's a great place to live. What advice could you give uh, having some experience already? My biggest piece of advice is look at the laws, especially the different like criteria, and also you have to think about like, are, are you willing to really do this? Is it worth it for you? Like that's my biggest piece of advice because at the end of the day, if you find people bothering and you're not really an extroverted person, you might find at the end of the day like, ah, you know, having someone else using your dishes or it's not, it's not for you. You know, always when you have people in your life for a longer period or a shorter period, you love to hear about uh, some great things that, that happened to them. Or uh, Do you have a great experience that you like to share about having roommates? When I started renting rooms, actually, uh, one, of the, one of the first roommates I found, the second one, actually, he was living at Freighton Inn. If you believe it? He was paying 130 bucks a night and he was on the verge of going out on the streets. Wow. And he was like, I'm really flexible. And I said to him, look, you know, like you can pay later. And he since moved out. He, he stayed there until last month. And he just said, thank you very much. He, he cried a little bit, if I'm being honest, but he wow. was really, really like happy that I gave him this chance. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Great. And now he's just starting university this uh, first in the next few months to get his uh, nursing degree. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I'm pretty proud of him. Welcome back to Exploring Fredericton Homes. 
The world of buying, selling, and leasing can be complicated and stressful. And that's where a great lawyer comes in. Next, we're going to meet Jack Youssef, who is a lawyer who specializes in real estate transactions. So Jack, I, I wanted to uh, bring you in today because I wanted to chat about your perspective from being a lawyer to a builder to a building owner and your look at the rental market yep. and how you see it changing over the next few years and what you think is going to happen. So what you're getting right now is you have this mixture of people that have been in the industry for a long time. Their properties are established. They're older. They're doing probably better than the person who's getting into it now, constructing, increased cost. The solution really is going to rest between the property owners, the tenants, and the government. You can't have two of them trying to fix the problem for the third. People that invest in real estate are really looking for an 8% growth. You take in a massive amount of risk, but you have an 8% growth. So what do you see as, as a local reasonable solution to the supply and demand issue? And you hear a lot of simple solutions, but it's something that has to be a marriage between tenants, landlords, and government. And by the way, a fourth party employers. Because reality, if your rent goes up, your groceries go up, eventually you either got to get another job or you have to get more from the job that you're at. The second part of it is that with the landlords, the landlords are going to work with tenants. They want good, solid tenants. If I have a person that moves out every 12 months, it costs me way more than someone who's there for five years. Right. With the government, incentives are going to create more housing, and everybody knows that the more housing you have, the price goes down because competition is king in a capitalistic society. It, it seems like a lot of the programs that are out through social development seem to make it very hard for somebody to want to, as a, somebody who has built a large building, it makes it very hard for somebody to want to jump in if they're holding the rents at a limited cap for a- 13 potential. years. So the potential of owning your building for 13 years with no profit, it would make it hard for a lot of people to jump into that particular market. It's a massive risk for the person who's taking on that endeavor. And you don't know whether you're going to get a tenant that's going to trash the place and do $10,000 worth of damage, whether you're going to have an internal mold problem that you didn't know about. And remember, it's a slow burn. It's an 8% growth. So building more units, do you think that is? Absolutely. Right. So you have tenants stop treating landlords like criminals and understand where it's really coming from because society only runs as fast as its slowest runner. Well, the irony is truly the, per the fact that a person can't get approved for a mortgage because the bank doesn't think they can afford it. Right. But the rental and stuff that they're paying is already currently more than all of those other things right. in certain scenarios. You're in a very unique crossroads right now. You have the government trying to determine when they're going to lower interest rates. And they're trying to hold it to get the money back that was lost, right. not wait too long for the recession because if they wait too long, we're crushed. And you have people that are just getting into a business en masse because of the, the population density is increasing so quick that everybody's running to the trough. But the number of small guys are going to reduce. Right. The number of big guys are going to increase. Fredericton back in the day had one or two property owners that had a lot of units. Right. Now Fredericton has like five. When you're looking for an ideal tenant, what would be somebody that you're looking for for one of your buildings? If you're controlling a commodity in, a, in an environment where there's a high demand and a short supply, you get to set the price and the rules. So for example, when I drafted my tenant rules, they're pretty intense because I want to protect my investment and I don't want to be someone's uh, concierge, right? right? So they're pretty intense and I charge a reasonable rent. We didn't raise our rents, by the way, for almost a year or two years after we built that new building. Say something did arise with the rentalsman and you had an appendix that said, hey, if you leave furniture, we're going to charge you this much. Does that hold up? The rentalsman system is another thing that needs to be either completely re, uh, re rethought um, or scrapped and something completely redone. Because th there's no quick solution for both a either a tenant or a landlord it, with the rentalsman situation. What you need is a quick resolution process. It's, it sounds like it's almost discrimination when it comes to age, no families, no children with rental units. How does that work? First of all, a lot of those things don't actually exist. You can't, the, the Human Rights Act protects against a lot of those things. Uh, landlords have tricks to kind of get around some of those things. Um, but it's not about, it's more about self-preservation, uh, Chris. Like from a landlord and a lawyer's perspective, it's more about self-preservation because if you just, if you could rent, if you had to rent to the first person that walks in the door and you know that that first person that walks in the door is about to cost you $100,000, you're not going to, you're not going to get into the rental business. If you take all the power away from landlords, who's going to want to be a landlord? 
what would be things that would make your life easier as a property owner? Primarily, quick resolution to issues that occur between two parties that both want the same thing. I want to have a place for you to live and you want to have a place to live. We don't have a resolution process to deal with anything that may arise between us that is functional. So you built two buildings during COVID. I built one, finished one just as COVID began. So we were two months away from tenants moving in when COVID struck. And it was a nightmare because I had to get builders to wear masks, schedule stuff. It was, we, we were on it, uh, but it was difficult. Um, but to give you an idea, the first building I built, which was finished as COVID started, um, was four times the square footage of the second one I built, but it was only double the cost. The first one took eight, uh, eight months to build, which was a feat in itself. The second one took like a year and a half. The first one had a dollar twenty-five or two dollar piece of two by four. The second one was twelve dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, I had a day job. I mean, I had a regular day job, and then after work every day, I'd come to the construction site and clean up and organize the materials because there are bricks of gold laying around your property. I had to deal with all the homeless breaking in and dealing with all that. Then I'd go home and do the accounting for it and order the materials for the next day. I'd get my three hours of sleep and I'd come back and do it again. If you knew of somebody else who was getting their start in property investing. What would your advice to them be? Don't, unless you, unless you really have done your research. So with construction right now, there's so many players that unless you really have your ducks lined up, I suggest you look into something else. So would you think somebody might have a better start if they avoided the new construction and just went with something that was pre-existing? Once the market stabilizes, right now you have an interesting uh, crossroads where you have interest rates that are a little bit high. You have the price of housing, which is still artificially inflated because COVID is still kind of sliding down. Um, uh, people are the, that became part of an industry during something that hasn't been the situation for 40 years is now going to start turning back to some new form of normal. Right. The way you practice real estate prior to COVID is probably much different than during COVID. And now you're starting to see the marriage of the two. Uh, New Brunswick has been in a bit of a bubble, but Fredericton's truly been in a bubble for 30 years um, because I've seen it. I've seen the property values and the, the, put it compared to my business. I've had steady growth for 30 years. Every year I've been in business and the years that like 2008, when we had the kind of the crash, I was stagnant that year or backpedaled maybe a tiny bit. And there was one other year there was a big financial crash and it was steady again. COVID, nobody expected it to be a boom. They all expected it to be destruction. It turned out they acted for destruction, which created the boom. During COVID, if you even asked for an inspection or, or even joked about trying to see the property before you had to bid 300,000 over it was assessed at, you'd get laughed out of the room, right? Right Now, I'm just starting to see inspections on clauses again. I'm just starting to see bank financing clauses again. During COVID, no, were no, you had an era of no condition contracts which is like terrifying when you think about it. You're making the single largest investment of your life and you have no ability to truly negotiate. All you have the ability is to compete with the other people that want it. So certainly COVID would have been a challenge to your business. What are the ways that COVID impacted your business? I think it impacted everybody um, in the construction business the same way. You no longer had any type of certainty on time of materials, cost of materials. To give you one example, our trusses, um, for the first building I built, which is a 24 four-story building, the trusses for the whole building were 130,000. The second building I built was tiny, six units residential and 4,000 square feet of commercial. The trusses went from 26 to 38 to 42 to 65. When I finally locked it in, they, they said, okay, 65. They sent me the final bill, they billed me 85. By the way, I only paid them 65.